Uh, now, Brandon, we, we brought you back because uh, you are the man that both Chibert and I go to whenever we have questions about routing, whenever we have questions about IPv6. Well, you and Jeff enters, but that's an inside joke, just uh, really good members of the of the Twilight, right? <laughs> but um, we've actually hit a, a, a milestone here because a lot of people think of IPv6 as the new thing but we've just hit like the 20th anniversary of the of the standard, have we not? That's right. That's right. Happy anniversary or happy birthday, IPv6. The uh, the core RFC that came out that described the IPv6 protocol um, came out 20 years ago on January 3rd. So we're now in our 21st year of having IPv6 standard. Of course, the the standard development process started a number of years earlier than that. Uh, but that was the first like uh, RFC published uh, that really full, fully fleshed out the protocol. Right. Uh, and I actually remember that. I was teaching at a high school in Los Angeles when the standard came out. And a, a lot, actually, a lot of our audience don't remember this. They don't remember a world that the older IT people do before NAT, uh, when this, this was really in the forefront. Because we didn't know what NAT was. NAT did not exist. There were no 192.168 addresses or 10.10 10 that you could you could take off a routable uh, a routable uh, uh, a link and so we were really really concerned that we were going to run out of ipv4 addresses like within the year and that's when ipv6 came out uh, do, do you remember that do, what what gear were you working on at that time oh i remember that i remember that very well i was uh working at the uh, university of florida i believe um we had uh, uh uh, a number of uh, routers from uh, Wellfleet, if you believe that, if you remember them, which of course uh, evolved to uh, Alcatel Lucent today, I suppose, um, and another company called Atlantec, um, also long gone. But um, um, the interesting thing about NAT is that even though we have NAT in place now that helps us preserve and, and extend the, late, the use of uh, IPv4 even after we've run out of address space, it still causes a lot of problems. If you've ever been a home user trying to play a game and have to punch holes through your uh, home router through your NAT in order to make a game work or something else like that, imagine now that as uh, IPv4 continues to run out of uh, address space, then not only do we have to do that at home, but also the shortage causes our upstream, our uh, our bandwidth providers to start natting our traffic too. So now we have one, two, three, four, you could have you know multiple NAT transitions in the path of your traffic. And if it was a pain in the butt just on your little home router at home, you imagine how much of a problem it's gonna be as we go forward with IPv4 and major providers having to NAT traffic. Yeah, natting a NAT of a NAT of a NAT is, uh... It, it gets interesting. It gets, it gets interesting. Yeah. Interesting is a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Emily the Strange in the chat room actually has, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joke. She says, happy birthday, IPv6. You don't look a day over never used, which I understand that because for the longest time, that was IPv6. IPv6 was always just about to be implemented, uh, but that's not the case anymore. I mean, I, I, I would say yes, five years ago, but... Now, not only do we see dual stack devices, we're starting to see devices that are being led out into the network that don't speak IPv4, IPv4 at all. Uh, well, I think, I think we're a little pretty premature on the don't speak IPv4 at all part, but, but let me throw some statistics at you. These are not my statistics. I, I collect these from around the web from reliable sources. So Google, for example, tracks how many hits to their various web properties are over IPv6 versus IPv4. Have the chart up, you can just put plug into Google and you can find the same chart I'm looking at. And they're peaking at 10% of their hits are on IPv6. And remember that's global, that's not just the US or, uh, or the Western countries, but that's, that's global. So across the whole world, having 10% of your uh, traffic on IPv6 is, is seriously significant. Um, there's some more statistics out there, too. I flipped another page here. So uh, Jeff Houston, who uh, is the chief scientist at uh, APNIC, the Asia. Oh, good. You found the chart from Google. Um, uh, Jeff Houston also has uh, some tracking that he does. Uh, the website's uh, potaroo.net, P-O-T-A-R-O-O.net. Uh, but anyway, um, he tracks uh, the BGP tables, the, you know, the global routing tables, and how much IPv6 is in use there. And if we look at just the... Uh, networks that provide transit, right? So people like Level 3 and AT&T, these big uh, carriers that carry our traffic across the world, you can, you'll see that uh, 65, 66% of them are uh, IPv6 capable. And again, this is a global statistic. So that's a lot. And, you know, anyone who tells you, hey, uh, my enterprise or, or my service uh, can't do IPv6 because my service provider doesn't support it, well, there is still some of that in some corners of the world, but for the most part, almost all of us have access to IPv6 from our upstream providers. 
um, especially in the in the Western world. Um, so really, that's that doesn't really fit well as an excuse anymore. Right. Uh, we've got Gadget Hog in the chat room saying that in the last week his Time Warner connection changed to IPv6 only. So I mean, we 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 still have devices that are, are can be dual stacked, but they're now releasing their IPv4 addresses and. It, I, I, Tell me if my if my take on this is right. So, so I'm not so I'm not aware of anyone doing IPv6 only. But what they what are some providers are doing, and I don't think Time Warner's in this camp. But what some are doing is they'll give you your only public address to the internet might be IPv6, while your IPv4 addresses may be behind a NAT somewhere. Um, so we're going to see some differentiation in the service provider space where um, you may end up having to pay more for a true public IPv4 address. And for probably your average grandma user, it probably doesn't matter very much. She's probably not doing anything that really requires a public IPv4 address. But if you're playing games, if you're doing any kind of high-performance networking, um, if you want to allow inbound connections, if you're basically probably anyone watching the show, you almost certainly want a real public IPv4 address, and that's going to be harder to get. But on the other hand, at least public you know, IPv6 addresses are a thing. I'm sitting here... In my uh, home office, I have a Comcast connection, and my Comcast connection does native IPv6. As a matter of fact, I believe all Comcast connections today uh, offer native IPv6. If not all, then it's a very large majority of them. So there's not there's not this place where we were maybe a year ago when we talked where um, it was unusual to have IPv6 capability from your service provider. These days, it's unusual to not have it. And so the folks that are doing IPv6 only stuff, that's a different camp. I'm not aware of too many service providers, really any that that will provide like a residential or enterprise connection that's IPv6 only. But what is happening is because the cellular carriers are able to control both their their network as well as the endpoints, right? You know, if you have a cell phone like mine, you have some control over what it does, but the network side, really, the carrier is controlling that. So since they can control all that, what we're starting to see is some um, some movement towards making cell phones IPv6 only. As a matter of fact, I believe a uh, I believe T-Mobile is doing a, a, a probably a beta test, maybe of some new iOS software that is only IPv6 uh, enabled, at least by default. Now, whether they'll actually deploy that as a production service or when, I don't know. When is eventually, but not right now. But we're starting to see some of the some of these folks making that move. And so, what I want people listening to this to think about is if I'm an enterprise and I have services I'm offering the world and I'm only on IPv4, think of all the translations that my traffic is going to have to go through to a cell phone user who only has IPv6. There's various methods to do that, but the bottom line is native is always better and faster. And if you don't have native IPv6, you're going to be left behind. Uh, let me ask you about that. I, I want to move to IPv4 in just a bit, but when we're talking about all those translations and that native is, of course, always going to be better, when do you see us getting to that point where we can actually go native? Because, I mean, there, there's there's some pain involved there, and the translations are working, even though I'm sure we're going to discuss some of the issues that are involved with you doing 6 to 4 and 4 back to 6, et cetera, et cetera. But when do you see a point that we could finally say, no, IPv6 is now clearly the standard and IPv4 is going away? Well, you know, my, my crystal ball seems to be missing at the moment. I'll have to look for that later. But um, I, I think I think we're getting close to that uh, on the, you know, three, four, five year kind of basis. And, and what I mean by, by that is that you, IPv6 becomes ubiquitous enough that we just assume that we have it and that it just works and that there's only a few places um, that don't support it. Um, but I can be completely wrong on that. Um, you know, uh, it, it's really difficult to tell how far people stretch things out. And, and as we all know, legacy protocols don't ever really totally go away. If you look hard enough, I'm sure you can still find some DECnet and some SNA out there on the internet in various corners as well. So even probably some IPX. So, you know, it doesn't ever totally go away, but you get that long tail effect where, um, where it becomes a small minority. I still have ArcNet running in, in one of my installations. So, of course yeah. you do. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's got to be there somewhere. Uh, okay, now let me ask this. I think this is a great bookend here because since the last time you were on This Week in Enterprise Tech, uh, when we were still talking about IPv4 and uh, address exhaustion, we actually hit IPv4 address exhaustion. It had been warned time and time again, but we finally got to the point where like, no, we've handed out the last block. So let me ask you, and I don't think you need your crystal ball for this one, but has the internet ended? <laughs> I, 
obviously the internet is completely over. Uh, that fad, <laughs> that fad has passed. <laughs> um, no, so uh, so yes, yeah, so, so the Aaron region, right, the American Registry of Internet Numbers, their region that they administer as one of the regional internet registries did completely run out of IPv4 addresses uh, quite some time ago now, but yeah, between the last time I was on and now. Um, does that mean you can't get IPv4 addresses anymore? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that they're going to cost you something. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that have excess IPv4 address space, so it is uh, acceptable to list that address space for sale, it's called a directed transfer, where you can go and create a, uh, a business relationship with someone and, and basically buy some address space. You still have to go through a justification process, but it is available. Of course, in the in the European region, it's it, they've been out of address space for longer than us, um, as well as APNIC, right, the Asia Pacific region. They all have some different um, policies where there's, in some cases, there are some smaller blocks of address space that you might be able to qualify out for, especially if you're a brand new. Uh, company, but for the overwhelming majority, they are out. So if you happen to be in Latin America or South America, and if you happen to be in Africa, good news, your registries do still have what we call the free pool of address space left. Um, if you haven't asked for your address space yet, you ought to do that right now if you happen to be in those regions. And and actually, I believe we do ha we do know a person who might be able to get everyone in the Twilight Riot uh, their own block. I think he still has a class, uh, class A. Uh, Brian, can we go to him? Hi, I'm T-Bird. I've got addresses you can all have. There, folks, you heard it here on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Just contact T-Bird at uh, uh, ADVNET Lab on Twitter, and uh, he'll be happy to hand you out some IPv4 space.